China's ambitions to be a space superpower have been boosted after becoming the first nation to land a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. The probe has already sent back an image of the largest, deepest and oldest crater in what's being seen as a major milestone in space exploration. A new Congress is being sworn in in the United States. President Trump's personal and business dealings are expected to come under intense scrutiny, with the Democrats now in control of the House of Representatives. Billions of pounds have been wiped off the value of the technology giant Apple after it announced its latest sales figures would be worse than expected. Eleven people have gone on trial in Saudi Arabia over the murder of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi. And it's emerged that a man held as part of the investigation into the murder of a security guard in Mayfair on New Year's Day is the son of the banned radical cleric Abu Hamza. China's scientists say the country is on its way to becoming an aerospace power after it became the first to land an unmanned craft on the far side of the moon. The Chang'e 4 robotic probe has already beamed back close-up images of the previously unexplored landscape, which is far more rugged than the side which can be seen from Earth. The craft and its rover are now preparing to carry out a series of experiments which could help reveal the secrets of the moon's formation. Our science editor, David Shookman, reports on the mission, which has opened a new chapter in lunar exploration. An instruction at mission control to commence landing. The spacecraft breaking its descent with small thrusters and then gliding to a gentle halt. Being on the far side of the moon, no direct communication with Earth is possible. So a second Chinese spacecraft had already been placed in orbit to act as a relay. And when the first pictures came through of a barren, heavily cratered landscape, there was loud applause. <laughs> the successful touchdown led to a flurry of coverage on Chinese state media, pointing out that no other nation has managed to achieve this feat. Back in the late 60s, NASA had considered landing on the far side, but ruled it out as too risky. So the region has never been explored in detail. And Robert Massey of the Royal Astronomical Society says it's very different to the side that we see from Earth. The far side is much more heavily cratered. It doesn't have these smoother lava plains, mare, blotting out those features that, that were there in the, the early lunar history. So that's a, an enduring mystery. That's uh, part of the interest in putting a probe there. The main interest in this probe, I think, is, is showing it can be done and also you know, getting science back, exploring this region we haven't been to before. Instruments will analyse the composition of the rocks. A small rover will survey the area. And one question driving many scientists is whether this mission might pave the way for a new era of astronomy. Dr Dave Clements of Imperial College London says the location would offer a unique view of the stars. There's great potential on the far side of the moon for astronomy, radio astronomy especially, because you've got the whole of the moon there shielding you from the radio noise of the Earth. The Earth is very loud in the radio, and if you want to do very sensitive observations, you need to get rid of that. You either do that actively, or you do it by putting an extremely large chunk of rock called the moon in the way to blot it all out. Future Chinese missions will explore the potential of the ice on the moon to supply astronauts with water and fuel. A permanent base is being considered. One leading Chinese scientist told me a few years ago of plans to open mines on the lunar surface to extract precious minerals. That may be decades away, but this latest mission shows the scale of ambitions. Today's historic landing demonstrates China's determination to become a leader in a new space race. It's taking on the traditional powers of America and Russia, as well as newer players from Europe, India and the private sector. Our Beijing correspondent John Sudworth examines what the mission means for Chinese prowess. Before the official announcement that it had been a success, there was almost no Chinese news coverage of the landing at all. It's a sign of just how much prestige is at stake for China, which now has big space exploration ambitions despite relatively humble beginnings. The first Chinese astronaut, or Taikonaut as they're called here, didn't reach space until 2003. Wu Wei-ren is the chief designer of China's lunar exploration program. If our lunar exploration is a success, we can make bigger contributions to mankind and improve China's ability and technology. So I don't think our exploration will stop. It will only go deeper, further, and we will invest more. 
As well as the lunar program, China is building its own space station and carrying out cutting-edge research in a number of areas. Concern has also been raised about its military ambitions in space. Its budget, however, is still a fraction of NASA's, at best around a quarter of the size. But when the US last visited the moon in 1972, China was still deeply impoverished, beset by the political chaos of Chairman Mao's cultural revolution and with a space program that had barely got off the ground. By that measure, today's success really is a giant leap. Members of the new US Congress are being sworn in this evening, with the Democrats taking control of the House of Representatives. The shift in power is likely to see repeated clashes with President Trump over the coming months. The Democrats have already said that they will introduce bills to end a partial government shutdown which has lasted 13 days. But Mr Trump insists he will block legislation which doesn't include funding for his border wall with Mexico. Our Washington correspondent Aline McBool is following the proceedings. The representatives elect and their guests will please remain standing and join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. It is a momentous day on Capitol Hill, but also one that's likely to signal the start of an even more turbulent and divisive time in Washington. As new members of Congress elected in November's midterms get sworn in, Democrats will have the majority and take control of America's lower chamber, the House of Representatives, for the first time in eight years. It'll be the most diverse representation ever seen there, with a record number of women having been elected, and some notable firsts, Muslim and Native American women lawmakers, and the youngest woman ever to be elected to the House, 29-year-old Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from New York. But it is an experienced campaigner who makes a huge comeback. Nancy Pelosi will become America's most powerful woman politically if, as is likely, she returns as Speaker of the House. We have important work to do in this Congress. We have to address the disparity of income in our country. We have to address climate crisis and what that means in terms of environmental justice in our country. We have to recognize that one in five children in America lives in poverty, and that's intolerable to us. Nancy Pelosi's work will start with dealing with the immediate issue of the wrangling over a budget that's meant a partial shutdown of the government for nearly two weeks. Donald Trump refusing to accept an agreement that doesn't include funding for a border wall. The Democrats adamant they'll never agree to that. But the real story today is that from now, Donald Trump has a political opposition with teeth. Accountability committees run now by Democrats will potentially be able to demand evidence on the president's tax and business affairs and aspects of the way he's governed that they see as having broken rules. Washington is bracing itself for a stormy 2019. Billions of dollars have been wiped off the value of Apple's shares after it announced its earnings for the final three months of last year would be lower than expected. The technology company is currently trading more than 8% lower. It blamed a slowdown in China, which caused a shiver through the American market and contributed to a 2% fall in the Dow Jones index. Other stocks with exposure to China saw their share prices tumble, including the British luxury fashion house Burberry, which closed nearly 6% down. Our business editor, Simon Jack, explains what's caused the change in Apple's fortunes. The iPhone is arguably the most successful consumer product of all time. The launch of a new model is a global event, and so, therefore, is a surprise warning from the chief executive that sales are not on target. This once trillion dollar company has now lost $400 billion in value. That's nearly two Shell oil companies since October. The Apple boss, Tim Cook, put it down to two main factors. The first is that consumers are not upgrading to newer, more expensive models as quickly, preferring to hold on to previous handsets they consider good enough for their needs or opting for cheaper alternatives. Second, Apple said it had not foreseen the magnitude of the economic deceleration in China. That phrase sent a chill through global markets and has profound implications for companies around the world, including big employers in the UK. China had hoped to transform its economy from one based on state spending, manufacturing, and exports into one driven by an increasingly affluent middle class. The evidence so far is that's not happening nearly fast enough and that Chinese consumers are reining in their spending. 
Sales of cars in China, the world's biggest automobile market, fell 14% in November compared with last year. That's bad news for companies like Jaguar Land Rover, which counted China as its biggest and most profitable market in 2017. There's also evidence that more of the country's consumers are opting to buy Chinese during a period of escalating international trade tensions, which most economists say produce no winners. South Korean intelligence officials say North Korea's deputy ambassador to Italy has disappeared, raising the possibility of a high-profile defection from Pyongyang. Media reports in Seoul suggest Jo Song-gil and his wife have gone into hiding and are seeking asylum in an unnamed Western country. Italy's foreign ministry says it's not aware of him making an asylum request. Our correspondent in Seoul, Laura Bicker, is following developments. Jo Song-gil was last seen leaving the ambassador's residence in Rome at the end of November with his wife, just days before his posting was due to come to an end. Officials in Seoul say they've had no contact with him since. The announcement comes amid unconfirmed reports that Mr Jo was asking the Italian authorities for protection in order to seek asylum in a third country. A defection by one of North Korea's elite could prove to be a huge embarrassment for leader Kim Jong-un. And according to some in Seoul, Mr Cho may have been more than simply an ambassador. His father and father-in-law are thought to be former diplomats and high-ranking Workers' Party officials. Pyongyang considers defectors traitors to the country and there can be severe consequences for any family members left behind, according to those who have managed to leave the secretive state. The last senior diplomat to defect, Tae Yong Ho, who was the deputy ambassador in Britain, told reporters he worked with Jo Song Gil. He claims Mr Cho was responsible for supplying luxury goods to North Korea and that he may know more about Pyongyang's nuclear plans. This is the kind of information that the US intelligence services would be keen to get their hands on. A man arrested as part of the investigation into the murder of a security guard at a New Year's Eve party in Park Lane in central London is the son of the banned radical cleric Abu Hamza. Scotland Yard says the charges against Imran Mustafa Kamel, who's 26, are not directly connected to the death of Tudor Simeonov. More details from our Home Affairs correspondent, June Kelly. Imran Mustafa Kamel made an initial appearance before Westminster magistrates, charged with possession of a firearm with intent to cause fear or danger and possessing a firearm when prohibited for life. He was arrested during the investigation into the fatal stabbing of a security guard, Timur Simeonov, early on New Year's Day. He was said to have been stabbed to death as he tried to stop gate crashers getting into a private party in Fountain House in Park Lane. Scotland Yard says the firearms charges faced by Imran Mostafa Kamel aren't directly linked to the death of 33-year-old Mr Simeonov or others injured in the attack. Two other men and a woman suffered stab wounds. Their injuries aren't life-threatening. No firearm was discharged during the incident. The trial of 11 men accused of being involved in the murder of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi has started in Saudi Arabia. There was an international outcry when it emerged that Mr Khashoggi had been drugged, killed and dismembered inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in October. Human rights groups have expressed doubts that the men will be given a fair trial. More details from our security correspondent, Frank Gardner. Saudi trials are often shrouded in secrecy. But the widely publicised and gruesome nature of Jamal Khashoggi's murder in Istanbul has ensured that this one at the criminal court in Riyadh will draw international attention. Amnesty International says the Saudi justice system falls far short of international law and that given the suspected involvement of the Saudi authorities in the murder, it doubted whether the investigation would be impartial. Western intelligence agencies have reportedly concluded that the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman most probably knew in advance about the operation to silence Mr Khashoggi, but Saudi officials deny this. The 11 defendants have not been named, but the prosecution is calling for the death penalty for five of them. Their lawyers appeared with them in court, and they've been granted more time to study the indictment against them. The trial is likely to revive an ongoing dispute between Saudi Arabia and Turkey, with both accusing each other of withholding information. You're listening to the 6 o'clock news on BBC Radio 4. The main news so far, scientists around the world have praised China for landing a robotic probe on the far side of the moon in a global first that boosts Beijing's ambitions to become a space superpower. 
Democrats are taking control of the US Congress with a promise to pass legislation that will bring a partial government shutdown to an end. And still to come. Your army needs you. Find where you belong. The drive to get snowflakes, binge gamers and selfie addicts to join up. The National Farmers Union has called for more clarity on how food standards will be protected after Britain leaves the EU. Its president, Minette Batters, said she'd heard enough warm words from ministers and she urged the government to introduce legislation for imported products. The Environment Secretary, Michael Gove, warned that farmers could be badly affected by a no-deal Brexit. He was speaking at a farming conference in Oxford, from where Phil Mackey sent this report. Although addressing an audience of farmers, Mr Gove's keynote speech was clearly also intended for wavering MPs. He warned of potential chaos should Britain leave the EU without a deal at the end of March, saying that smaller businesses and consumers would suffer most because of additional border checks, tariffs and delays. He stressed there would be a much smoother transition if the Prime Minister's proposals were voted through. The turbulence which would be generated by our departure without a deal would be considerable. Nobody can be blithe or blase about the real impact on food producers in this country of leaving without a deal. The Environment Secretary said farmers should take advantage of new opportunities after withdrawal. But the president of the NFU, Minette Batters, worried that cheap imports might disrupt British production and urged the government to legislate to ensure food quality is preserved. We're very proud of our high standards, we want to maintain them and we want food coming onto our shores to be produced to those same standards. At a separate event a short distance away, Mr Gove answered more technical questions about the future of farming, biosecurity and environmental standards. But uncertainty over Brexit still cast its shadow. Guy Watson is the founder of Riverford Organic, the vegetable delivery business. It's just hugely disruptive and um, you know the uncertainty is just a massive distraction from us getting on with our jobs of you know, producing good, wholesome, sustainable food and farming the land well. And it, I, I just find it immensely frustrating, I'm afraid. Farmers were asked at the beginning of the day to describe how they felt about Brexit. Buoyant, confident, apprehensive, or like crying for help. Mr Gove told them that most days he experienced all four emotions. Further questions are being asked about a firm which was awarded a £13 million contract to run extra ferry services in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Seabourn Freight is now facing claims that the terms and conditions on its website were copied from a takeaway restaurant. Our business correspondent, Jonty Bloom, reports. The contract with Seabourn Freight was already controversial, as the company has no ships and seems never to have run a ferry service of any kind. However, the company's website is hardly improving matters, with one sentence under the Placing and Order section pointing out it's a customer's responsibility to thoroughly check the supplied goods before agreeing to pay for any meal slash order. The Department for Transport has defended Seabourn, saying that section was put up in error. Seabourn's website also has a timetable with no planned sailings on it. It does also have a Twitter account, but it seems to have only ever tweeted the local shipping forecast the last time on the 21st of September last year, while its logon portal just seems to be an image of customers' name and password boxes rather than an actual means of entering the company's website. Seabourn could not be contacted for a comment, but announced today that it has started dredging Ramsgate Harbour which is currently not deep enough to take cross-channel ferries. It's emerged that a Muslim convert who's admitted planning a terror attack in central London pretended to be engaging with the government de-radicalisation scheme called PREVENT. Lewis Ludlow, who's 27 and from Rochester in Kent, had 16 meetings and a telephone call with officials from PREVENT in the six months before his arrest. One of the meetings was on the same day that Ludlow took photographs of potential targets, including Oxford Street and Madame Tussauds. He'll be sentenced later. Russian media say a former US Marine arrested in Moscow has been charged with spying. Paul Whelan, who was born in Canada to British parents, was detained last week while visiting the country. His lawyer has appealed for bail. Our diplomatic correspondent James Landale reports. Paul Whelan was arrested by Russian state security officers last Friday and now faces more than 10 years in prison if convicted of espionage. His family say he's innocent and was in Moscow to attend the wedding of a fellow former Marine. 
Mr. Whelan's defence lawyer, Vladimir Zerebenkov, told the state-run news agency, Ria Novosti, that he had appealed for bail. He said Mr. Whelan, who's been held in Moscow's Lofotova prison, remained in good spirits. Mr. Whelan, who's 48, was born in Canada to British parents. He served 14 years in the US Marine Corps doing two tours in Iraq before being discharged for bad conduct in 2008. He's currently head of global security for an American company supplying vehicle parts. He has visited Russia several times and appears to be a frequent user of Russian social media. One Russian news agency has claimed Mr. Whelan was caught receiving a digital storage device containing a list of intelligence officials, but that's not been corroborated. There has been speculation that Mr. Whelan was arrested so he could be exchanged with Maria Botina, a Russian gun rights activist who was jailed in the US last month. She pleaded guilty to acting as a Russian state agent trying to influence US conservative groups, but the authorities in Moscow insist she is innocent. A man who subjected a television presenter to a six-year stalking campaign has been jailed. Bristol Crown Court heard that Gordon Hawthorne, who's 69 and from Somerset, sent threatening letters and cards to Alex Lovell, a presenter on BBC Points West. She suffered panic attacks as a result of the correspondence. From Bristol, Charlotte Callan reports. Gordon Hawthorne began writing to Alex Lovell in 2012. She described the initial correspondence as filthy, but two years ago, the tone turned threatening. Hawthorne said he would rape the presenter and claimed he was watching her closely enough to smell her hair. In police interviews, he admitted stalking her, but tried to downplay the impact of his conduct. Like I said, I got an obsession for her, yeah. but um, it's a harmless obsession. Well, not, not harmless, but you know, there's no way I'd um, do anything. I would have sent her a birthday card at the end of this month. Yeah. <laughs> Hawthorne, who wasn't previously known to police, was caught after another woman recognised his distinctive handwriting following an appeal by Avon and Somerset Police. At an earlier hearing, he pleaded guilty to one charge of stalking involving serious alarm or distress. Today, he was jailed for two and a half years. Alex Lovell said she welcomed the strong message sent out by the courts and that justice has been done. He claimed to be near, he claimed to be watching, he claimed to be strong enough to have raped several times before. I'm glad that it sent out a message to anybody who is frightening somebody else. It's not acceptable, it's not okay. Avon and Somerset Police have praised Miss Lovell for her bravery in speaking out. A spokesman said the case highlighted the fact that stalking didn't have to involve watching or following someone, and Hawthorne was now paying the price for his cruel campaign of harassment. Figures from NHS England suggest hospitals are coping better this winter compared with other years. Over the festive period, there were fewer occasions when A&E departments were forced to turn ambulances away than in 2017. However, it's warning that pressures remain on the service. Scientists are hopeful that a new breathalyzer test could lead to simpler and less invasive ways of diagnosing cancer at an earlier stage. A two-year clinical trial has begun, and researchers say if it's successful, the device could be used by GPs in the future. Our health reporter, Philippa Roxby, has the details. Researchers in Cambridge want to find out if the thousands of chemicals present in our breath could reveal more than just what we ate last night. The clinical trial, which is just starting, will collect breath samples from one and a half thousand people. Initially, it will focus on those with suspected esophageal and stomach cancer, followed by people with other cancers, as well as healthy individuals. Scientists believe different cancers give off their own signature molecular pattern or smell, and using breath analysis technology, they hope to identify them. If the technology is proven, breath tests could be used by GPs to decide if at-risk patients need to be referred for more diagnostic tests. Professor Rebecca Fitzgerald is leading the trial at Cancer Research UK's Cambridge Centre. One of the problems is uh, with diagnosing cancer early is you have to really make the test as easy as possible because often people are quite reluctant to go to the hospital for checkups um, if your symptoms are quite subtle or maybe even before you have symptoms at all. So the test needs to be something ideally that you could do right at the GP surgery. Researchers around the world have been working on the possibility of a breath test for cancer and other diseases for many years. Although there are promising signs, it is not yet clear how accurate they could be. It will be two years before the results of this exploratory trial are known. 
In the city, the 100 share index ended the day 42 points lower at 6,693. A short time ago on Wall Street, the Dow Jones was down 459 points at 22,886. On the currency markets, the pound was up 0.3 of a cent against the dollar at $1.26.2 cents. Against the euro, sterling was down 0.3 of a cent at one euro 10.6 cents, making a euro worth 90.4 pence. Julia Grant, a leading campaigner for the rights of transgender people and the subject of a groundbreaking series of BBC documentaries, has died at the age of 64. Ms Grant has been described as a pioneer who helped change public attitudes. The programmes were the first of their kind on British television and followed her through gender reassignment. Our correspondent Angus Crawford looks back on her life. Later this week on Two, a change of sex, an inside story trilogy which follows George Roberts in his long story... It was truly groundbreaking and had never been seen on British television before. Five documentaries following Julia Grant through gender reassignment, surgery and life afterwards. The first programme was watched by more than nine million people. She originally contacted the BBC to complain about the portrayal of trans people on screen, but was then persuaded to become the subject of one of the very first Fly on the Wall productions. Here she is four years ago, talking about what it was like. Whether it was good or bad, the walls I kept coming up against on my journey, and I decided myself that the only way I could do this was by being honest to myself. So. I think the films were very, very honest. They were very, very open. Julia Grant wrote two books about her experiences and worked all her life to further trans rights. She was considered by some in the community to be controversial and argued against gender reassignment surgery for children. But her brother said today that she was inspirational, had built more bridges than she burned and was always there to fight the cause. A rescue operation is underway to help a sperm whale trapped in a sea loch near Dennis in Sutherland. The 30-foot-long mammal is believed to be tangled in a rope in Loch Erebol. Coast Guards say the whale is still swimming and they've urged the public to keep a safe distance. The term snowflake is widely used as a derogatory label for young people deemed to be too sensitive, over-emotional or easily offended. Such individuals, you might assume, would not make ideal candidates to serve in the British Army. But with the personnel shortfall running into the thousands, the army is casting its net wider and snowflakes aren't being frozen out. Our defence correspondent Jonathan Marcus explains. There may be no Lord Kitchener with his pointing index finger, but the design of the Army's new recruiting posters with their slogan, Your Army Needs You, inevitably prompts comparison with those from over a century ago. This is only the latest stage in a publicity campaign that seeks to spread the Army's message to a much wider pool of potential recruits, in many cases people who might never have considered themselves suited to a military career. The posters are explicitly directed at me, me, me millennials, class clowns, binge gamers, phone zombies, snowflakes and selfie addicts. But each of these categories is given a quality on which the army seeks to draw, whether it be self-belief, spirit, drive, focus, compassion or confidence. Two of the six posters show women in uniform and three show soldiers from ethnic backgrounds. The posters are accompanied by television and radio spots in a similar vein. Imagine a woman in a warehouse, parking boxes day after day. You might see a lack of ambition, but we see patience and precision. And there are troops on aid missions that need that right now. Your army needs you. Find where you belong. Sedge Army Jobs. The Army insists that since its current recruiting campaign began, job applications for regular soldiers are at a five-year high. But this has to be set against more fundamental problems in recruiting, which have left the Army some 5,000 personnel short of its 82,000 target strength. The headlines again. Chinese scientists have claimed the country is on its way to becoming an aerospace power after landing, uh, the landing of an unmanned craft on the far side of the moon. Members of the new U.S. Congress are being sworn in, with the Democrats taking control of the House of Representatives. Billions of dollars have been wiped off the value of Apple's shares after the technology company said a slowdown in China's economy had led to lower earnings.
North Korea's deputy ambassador to Italy has disappeared amid suggestions that he might have defected. And it's emerged that a man arrested as part of an investigation into the murder of a security guard in central London is the son of the banned radical cleric Abu Hamza. BBC News.